No, that's me. That's me. I'm hopping into my Bible study. Okay, honey. Yeah, Karen, come on in, please. Okay. Um, my major triggers are extreme stress. And and the accept the things you cannot change. And that's really going on. Hi, sisters. Hey, Evie. Hey, sis. Hey, A. Really bad place. Not okay. I, I hesitated to come in here because I'm really, really not okay. Would you had a would you hard day. Speak to us about it, honey. This is a it's your meeting. Talk to us about anything that you want. I'm here to listen. Chrissy's here to listen. Everybody, that's what this room is for. Please share. Well, we had to have an emergency meeting about my dad. Your dad? Because uh, my brother-in-law from Minneapolis is with him right now. And and he's supposed to go where his wife is because his wife was really nice to him last night. She will turn in a minute. And she already has. I thought her daughter and I were close friends in high school before our parents got married. And um, now. Last night she was so sweet to him and to, today she's like, if he can't behave, he can't be here. So we're all over the country. We're from right now, Washington, D.C., Minneapolis, Minnesota, uh, San Francisco, and
Good evening, good evening, good evening, family. How are you? How are you? How are you? How are you, beloved? Hi, Lily. I say hi, yo. Hi, you. Excuse me, Nelson. Yes, Pink. G. Come on, Pink Lip, Alicia. <laughs> G got Pink one too. Hey, G, I'm at you here, Pink. Hey, girl. Yes, Pink Lip and Glasses. Come on, Pink Lip and Glasses. <laughs> you aggravating, Glenn. I said, Regina got Pink one too. I said, I'm, my lips matching her color. <laughs> yes, it's Regina, yes. Bajina, yes, said hello. Because your name is Bajina. All I gotta say is, yay, low I walk <laughs> through the valley of the shadow. <laughs> I shall fear no evil. Cause God will. All right, I'm done. But it's really Alicia with his lip and his glasses. It really is. Oh, my. Kalia, stop it. It's a lip for me. It is a lip for me. Praise God. <laughs> Bye, Kalia. What's up with it? Hey, y'all. Hey. 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 
Hey, G. Stop with, with it. Why you got that dry look on your face? Because it's dry. Yeah, you know, <laughs> I'm helping as with homework. The valley of the shadows. I will be no Yes, Lord. Who got that on? <laughs> Moses. Apostle. <laughs> hey, baby. Hey, twin. Listen, that song been in my spirit all day. I don't care. All day. Like, all day. Rabasete kelebo. Brando. Ke masoto ki asha mas. E kelebe soto le pandi eleman. Come on, man. How long you gonna beg the juice? Right I'll be only one second, guys. It's okay, Nilsa. We we'll wait here for you. Say hi, Titi. Hi to you. Hi, baby. Hello oh. there. Okay. Y'all all right? Listen, today is a really big and special day for me. All right. Uh, matter of fact, can, can you hold this for me? Okay, so it's Tarby and... Hello there. Y'all all right? I don't think we're supposed to hear that. <laughs> Today is a special day. Roslyn, she's one of my, my friends that I uh, asked to come on. I'll send the link to. Her name oh, Roslyn. Yeah. Hey, Roslyn, welcome to Soul. Soul. Yeah. Welcome. Hello, welcome. Hello, everyone. Hey, Sue. Hey. <laughs> Hey, Rob. Hey, girl. You have to see mom. No, it's not that for me. It's everybody, Rob. It's everybody. I'm packing Z some food. What'd you say, Nilsa? You got some good news. I'm packing Z some food. Moses, put your face, though. Is it? 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 Is I want to play now. I want to play now. I want to play now. Hey, <laughs> oh, eat your dinner. Oh, wait, yes. Hi. Hi. Peace and blessings, family. 
Um, What's up? Welcome to the Roundtable 2.0 Bible Study. Thank you for those that are able to get on. Thank you for those that are able to put their camera on so we can interact with you a lot in real time. Um, God bless everybody. I believe Christ came in the flesh. God is with us. We already have the victory in him. Amen. Would anyone like to open us up in prayer? Jermaine, thank you, Lord. Felix, if you're not going to open up some prayer, can you hit your mute button, beloved? God bless you, man of God. I was going to say if I could open us up in prayer, but yeah, I can mute right. myself. Right. Well, I said if you're not going to, mute yourself. But go ahead. Yeah, I I don't think you're go ahead, beloved. All right, Chief. <clears throat> Father God, we give you thanks, glory, and honor in this beautiful day that you've given us to come together on one accord in one place in this place, this round table that you have yet against blessed us with for another week, Lord. I ask that uh, whomever the speaker be that you faithfully and truthfully take that person's tongue, Lord, and you speak through that person, Lord, that we all have a hear to hear what the Spirit is saying, that we can come together, we can grow in knowledge and wisdom and a sound mind in you, Lord, that we can edify ourselves, grow more from faith to faith, Lord, go deeper into you, Lord, continually enduring in your word and your, and your holiness and in the fullness of your presence, Lord, so that we can continually learn to endure in you, Lord. All this we ask in your son's holy and precious name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. Peace and blessings. Um, today we're going to be talking about a healthy soul. We're going to be talking about a healthy soul. Uh, I think it would be in correlation with, um, <clears throat> it would be in correlation with what um, uh, Pastor Joe spoke on Sunday. I thought he did a good job. I hope, I hope you guys were blessed by his message. So we're going to be talking about a healthy soul. And um, I hope today bless you. I hope today God shines a light on some areas in your life that need to be perfected and strengthened. Right? So we're going to uh, the third book of John, chapter one. I think it's only one chapter. So we're going to the third, third book of John, not John chapter three, the third book of John. All right, everyone there? All right. Um, I'm going to be reading the um, New King James Version. <clears throat> and uh, I'm going to read the scriptures, and I want to just open it up to hear you guys' perspective. Forgive me, I'm getting a little tired. Long day. But, um, yeah. Yeah. His strength is made perfect in our weakness. Amen. So this is his third John chapter one. I'm going to read maybe one through four. The concentrated verses on verse two. So it says the elder to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth. So this is John, one of Jesus disciples, became an apostle. And he's writing a letter to some of the churches that he planted. Yes.
So he's writing a letter to the churches that he planted. And he says, the elder to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth. Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health, just as your soul prosper. King James said, beloved, I wish above all things that you may prosper and be in good health, even as your soul prospers. He says, for I rejoice greatly when brethren came and testified of the truth that is in you. Just as you walk in truth, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. So this is John, um, an apostle, a spiritual father, the one that planted this church, and he's writing a message to them, um, just, just expressing his desires for them to prosper and be healthy. Um, even though this is John writing this, the Bible says all scriptures was given by inspiration of God. So in this scripture, in this letter that's given by John to his servants, you know, to his sons and daughters and to the church, it contains the heart of, fa of the father, right? All scriptures is given by inspiration of God. So it's not just John saying this. This is an inspiration that comes from the heart of Father God, that the Father wishes, our Heavenly Father wishes above all things. The King James says, I like the King James. Verse two, beloved, I wish above all things that you may prosper and be in good health, even as your soul prospers. So I just want to get some feedback on that. And I want to hear your thoughts on that. What does that mean to you? What does that speak to you? Um, what, what, what you may get out of that verse right there. So just raise your hand and I'll call on you accordingly. And uh, yeah. Go ahead, wife. Okay, so what I what I believe that that's saying is like, even as you're growing uh, and maturing spiritually, that hopefully the same thing happening to you naturally in success, in finances, in your health, in your physical body, uh, same. Yeah, amen. That's good. That's good. Anybody else? Come on, Alicia. Um, what I would say is that <clears throat> pretty much what Regina said, just more like, you know, as I'm growing stronger within the Lord, as my uh, my spiritual ears or my spiritual senses are being sensitive to what is going on in the spirit realm being connected to the father <clears throat> as i'm growing there you know the father also is going to be able to like pour more into me and give me up more to be able to handle because as i'm growing he's being able to trust me with a little bit more so that way i can be healthy mentally physically emotionally and spiritually all tied together because I can't have one without the other at all joint supply and everything gets connected. Okay, amen. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, let me ask you, what do you, what do you, what are your thoughts about when it says, 
I wish that you prosper. What do you think about prosperous? Prosper. Would it, would it when it when it says prosper, what comes to mind? Go ahead, Kenny. Shalom, everybody. Ignore the background music. Um, I'm somewhere. But I, I wanted to say oftentimes people think of prosperity like as far as finances and how they're doing in life, you know, their career, their goals, and stuff like that. But I, I think John's focus on his text is he, he's referring to the health of our soul, you know, which includes our mind, how we prosper in our mind how we prosper in, in alignment with the will of God, and he, even how we prosper in our emotions. You know, um, yesterday, I, I decided to ride my motorcycle to work, and I lost $2,000. I lost my license, credit card, debit card, pastor card, get out of jail free card. I lost, like, everything, you know what I mean, that I had while I was riding my motorcycle. And then... I didn't even notice, but I'm pulling up to the barber shop, and then while I'm ready to pull into the parking lot, the clutch was in my hand. The whole time, I don't even know if the clutch was off, but I was willing, I was able to change gears, and I'm, I'm doing like over 100 miles per hour, coming down 55, 42, down to 130 to get to my job. And I was like, yo, the clutch could have been off the whole time and God held it on just so I could change gears like you know I wasn't even worried about what I lost because I could have died I could have been you know injured paralyzed hurt you know but I was able to praise God yesterday some people like yo you crazy you lost that I said I don't care about that if I had to lose that to be able to walk and talk to you today then I feel prosperous like I was at peace. I wasn't even mad. I just had, you know, to do what I do. But I feel like when you're in the middle of a storm, you could be at peace. When everything's failing around you, you know what I'm saying? You could walk through the valleys of the shadow of death. You could be the Ezekiel looking at the dry bones and not get discouraged. You know, things could look so dark for you, but you're prospering because you, you hold on to God's word and you feel prospered. You hold on to his word that he says he'd never leave you nor forsake you. You hold on to his word that this is my beloved son. You hold on to the hope where he receives and says, well done, my good and faithful servant. And that that prosperity of, uh, uh, of, of things hoped for in the future, that his word says that he comes back for you, that he goes to prepare a place for you. You know, that, that hope that you will get restored. You know what I'm saying? All those hopes is is what prospers you because it's 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 not like finances health is wealth you know just being able to be healthy i was like yo man i'm thank god that i'm walking today like i don't know how i got to the barbershop without a clutch i can't even change gears but as soon as i pull up it just it the screw was missing the whole time god held that together and i just you know praise god because you know he keeps us even in the storms and, 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 you know what I mean? Like, like when, when Pastor Joe Dingles was preaching, man, I was like, bro, I started seeing like, you know, things like crazy. Like you're able to hit, see with your ears. You'll be able to see like Ezekiel's vision when you have eyes all around you. And that's so prosperous when you can see things, you know what I mean? When your focus is on Christ, it don't matter. Everything else, it just, it's just vanity. It's just, it's like Ezekiel said, all that is vanity. You know what I mean? But when your focus is on God, that's where true prosperity is. And, and, and that's where I'm at. Thank you for that. Real good. Thanks for sharing. <laughs> Go ahead, that's real good, bro. Thanks for sharing. Um, Felix. You still want to share? Yeah, I was going to. I was going to share is um the part where what um even as I soul prospers, I you the more we the more we we have faith 
in God is the more we prosper with God because we have to believe yesterday when we were in prayer uh, <laughs> man when we was in prayer yesterday no part of me I wasn't understanding but you said you have faith you put that faith because he's a rewarder, rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So faith, that begins with faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. So if we, if we, if we say we believe in God for something and we lack it in faith, then we're not pleasing God. So I believe Faith and love go together because you have faith in God that you don't see, but yet you, you, you clinging on something that you want, but you're not believing in God for it. You just want it. So your, your heart, your heart, your love is in the wrong thing. So I'm taking, I'm taking it as like our love for God, the faith to have love for God that we can't see, but we know is real because we are diligently, faithfully seeking him and he will reward us in due time if we continue to diligently endure in his word, no matter what may be going on. So we're prospering faithfully and diligently. Thanks for letting me share. Amen. Thank you for sharing that, beloved. Thank you. Uh, Nilsa. Um, so when I read the scripture, I, I receive it or understand it as, can you, can you stop things? Um, like a stirring up, like a progressive stirring of, of your, of your spirit, like of your soul. So to be progressive in it to be progressive in stirring up the, the soul or like progressive in the awakening of your soul. Thanks for letting me share. Amen. All right, next. Um, go ahead, Kalia. Um, so when I think of prosperity or prospering, I think of, um, flourishing and like success. So uh, to me, it's like, you know, above all things, I may prosper and be in good health. Like, like Regina said, and Alicia said, um, that even as we are in good health and even though, even as our soul prospers, that we are successful um, in the things that God wants to uh, bring out of us and put in us, you know, successful in um, deliverance. Like when I think of prospering of the soul, I think of deliverance. And so um, that's what I get when I think of the prosperity, like the, the success and the flourishing um, of our souls, which to me is equated to deliverance. Good, it's very good. Good stuff, everyone. Did anybody else want to share? <clears throat> all right, amen. That's all great stuff. Did anybody want to connect to anything that we shared? I'm sorry, I took my son to eat and I ate like, I ate way too much. That thing just hit me. I got that itis. All right. So I got that itis, man. All right. So basically everything you guys shared, I'm in agreement with 100%. <laughs> um, it was a whole blessing. And I thank God for what you guys shared. Um, what I want to focus on, a couple words, prosper, health, and even. And then I'm gonna toss it to Brittany and I'm gonna let her share. So 
in this in this context, the word prosper it means success. So, um, it means success. It actually means to have a successful journey. <clears throat> so, the word prosper it means to have a prosperous journey. I cause to prosper, pass to pass. I have a a happy, successful journey. All right. Um, to be profitable, leading to real success, good fortune. Um, biblically, when we talk about prosperity, it means to be fruitful and multiply. So prosperity in the father's eyes, what he's shown me is that prosperity means to be fruitful. So it, prosperity doesn't necessarily equate to having a million dollars. I mean, God, you know, Joseph was a slave, but the Bible said that he was prosperous because God was with him. How was he a slave, but he was prosperous? That means if he's a slave, he didn't even own his own house. He was in bondage to someone else. He wasn't even free to do whatever he want. But yet in a state of bondage, he's not even free to do whatever he want. And he doesn't own any of his own stuff. The Bible says that he was prosperous. And what that means is that Joseph, in every job that he had, he excelled, he finished the assignment, and he exceeded expectations every time. He prospered because God was with him, which means that he exceeded expectation. He never failed, and he completed every assignment given to him. Um, in the Old Testament, the Bible says that Moses it says that with the people of God with Moses, they were in the wilderness. They could not work. They did not have jobs. They, they were um, pilgriming. They were journeying through a desert land. They could not produce their own crops. They could not farm. They could not cultivate animals. They could not go to the store and buy new clothes. But the Bible says that God prospered them. It says that he prospered them. And it says that on their journey, None of, the, none of their shoes withered, none of their clothes withered. So they had the same clothes on for 40 years and they never had holes in their clothes. So God prospered them because he sustained them on their journey. So, you know, I'm just giving you some ideas of what prosperity mean. It doesn't just mean to have a million dollars, you know? So the Bible says, so the other word I want to break down to you is health. So when he says prospering, being good health, he's not talking about spiritually. He's not talking about in your soul. He's talking about tangibly. Tangible, natural things. All right. So he's saying, I want you to prosper. I want you to be successful on your journey. I want you to be productive. I want you to bring forth fruit. I want you to bring, I want you to be fruitful and multiply in every area of your life. I also want you to be healthy. Um, the word healthy means to be sound. It means to be healthy. Um, it means I am well, I'm in good health. I am right, reasonable, pure, and uncorrupted. So when you get sick in your body, that's a form of corruption. That's a form of death. <sighs> so you got different forms of sicknesses. You got mental illness, right? You got ADHD, schizophrenia, anxiety, stress, depression. All of these are forms of corruption and sickness. Anger is a, is a form, is a sickness. Selfishness is a sickness, right? So to be healthy means to be sound. It means to be pure. It means to be uncorrupted, right? Um, the scripture says it's the word hygieno, which we get the word hygiene from. And it means in good working order, hence healthy and sound condition. It means to be free from debilitation or handicap 
hence functioning holistically with all parts working together. So when God said he wants you to be in good health, he wants you to be sound. He wants you to be pure. He wants you to be uncorrupted. He wants he want things to be in good working order. He wants your life to be in decency and order. He wants everything in your life to work together to bring good results, to bring good success, to bring prosperity. That means health in your relationships. That means health in your job. That means health with your family. That means health in your relationship with God. That means balance. You know what I'm saying? A lot of times we get so extreme in certain areas, like we extreme with God and we neglect our family. Like we're extreme with our children and then we neglect this. You know, we are extreme with work, but we neglect this. It's no balance. It's not healthy because all these things are supposed to work together in good working order. You know what I'm saying? We allow bitterness or unforgiveness in our hearts or different things like we allow offense to come in our relationships. So it's the desire. I believe it's the desire of Father God, even though John is saying this is his desire. I believe God wanted in the scripture to be an example of us to us that it's also his desire, God's desire. You know, that we are healthy in our relationships, that we are healthy in our interactions with people, that we are pure, that is uncorrupted in our conversations and the way we communicate with one another, like the way we handle our affairs, the way we handle our finances, all things is in decency and order. You know what I'm saying? Every There's a balance, like, you know what I'm saying? Like, you're not sowing all the money into the church and making sacrifices for other people, but not taking care of your personal responsibilities, your finances. I mean, your bills and your personal things, that's not healthy. That's extreme. You see what I'm saying? Or all you do is worry about yourself, but there's no investment into the community. That's not healthy. That's not balanced. You know what I'm saying? So God wants us to be balanced and healthy in, in our investments in all these areas and be pure the way we interact in our assignments, whether personal, in the community, in the church, with our family, in our relationships, in the way we deal with finances, in, the, in, the, in our business interactions. He wanted to be integral, pure, healthy, and in, in, in order, and sound working condition, which means in balance. So when we not balanced, we not healthy. And you can tell when you're not balanced, if you're working too hard, you know what I'm saying? If you're busy all day and you don't get any sleep, guess what? Tomorrow, the next day, you may feel torn down outside of God's grace supernaturally giving you energy. You may feel torn down. You may feel tired. You feel exhausted. You feel weary. Yeah, because you're not operating in good health. All right. So this is a very generic level of what I'm saying. You know, God is able to comp if God is calling you to something, God is able to compensate that and his grace could be sufficient. But I'm just talking about in balance and in health. And I'm saying that's what the scriptures is talking about. So God wants us to have a balanced life and healthy. He don't want us to be all over the place, operating in corruption, unpure. But we can only we can only we can only have success and prosperity. We can only be productive. Right. And we can only accomplish health, healthy conditions in the way we interact with people and the way we interact with different things in our life. We can only accomplish that. The Bible says even. So that's telling you that these things run parallel. So you want a mil you want God to bless you with a million dollars. You want God to bless you with a million dollars. Amen. But yet. You're irresponsible with your finances and you think in poverty. So what I'm telling you is that natural success and productivity, that, that, that things working in, in a healthy way and in decency and order, that can only happen as your soul prospers. So you can only have good health and good success in your life to the capacity that your soul has that same thing. So to much is given, to much is required. You want God to do the most, but yet your mind hasn't elevated to match that level of success and health. 
Okay. And you're like, well, how does this match up? Well, I'm gonna break it down. So, so a lot of times what happens is we have interactions in our lives, whether we're children, teenagers, some of us even in the present, right? So, you know, we, we, we talk a lot about strongholds, deliverance and all these things. Well, when it comes to being demonized and affected by the enemy, the number one way that people are demonized and attacked and affected by the enemy is trauma. It's the number one way. It's the number one way. Even more than believing lies, false doctrines, all of that. The number one ways that people are demonized and attacked by spiritual evil forces is traumas. Why? Because when you're affected by trauma, it creates a hole in you. So when you look at the definition of trauma, I don't want to go too much into it, but when you talk about a trauma, if you think about the trauma unit in the hospital, what type of people go to the trauma unit? People that are shot, stabbed, major car accidents, where they lose limbs, their body is punctured. Because when you're talking about trauma, you're talking about something that creates a hole. So then you got emotional traumas, mental traumas, traumas from losing people, traumas from being attacked, abused, and all these different things. So they create holes in your soul, holes in your heart, holes in your life, holes in your wherever. And these holes become an open door for you to be attacked by demons. I just got to shoot it straight to you. So, you know what I'm saying? Therapy is cool, but you need a measure of deliverance that only God can bring because the therapy can help you, but it's like God got to deliver you from the evil spirits. He has to. Now, I'm saying that because when you experience a trauma, what happens is when you experience a trauma, especially at a young age, you don't know how to process that. Some of us experience things that we should have never experienced. Some of us experience things at a young age that we should have been sheltered and protected from, but you know, whatever, it happened for a reason, right? Well, it didn't happen for a reason. The enemy attacked you. God didn't have any reason for allowing those things to happen to us. Like God works all things together, but God is not sending the enemy to traumatize you so he can give you some type of testimony. He just work all things together. That's not God's will for our life. You know what I'm saying? So a lot of times God get the rap for stuff that he's not responsible for. He's responsible for working it together, but he's not responsible for causing these things that the enemy do. You know what I'm saying? Render unto Caesar's what's Caesar's and render unto God's what's God's. So every God did not do everything. He's not responsible for everything that happens in your life, but he is responsible for weaving everything together to make a beautiful masterpiece of your life. The Bible says he beautifies the meek with salvation. The Bible says he, he makes all things beautiful in his times. He, he gives you beauty for ashes. He's responsible for the beauty. Amen. So I'm saying this because when we had these traumas and stuff at an early age, you don't know how to process it. So if you notice when certain situations happen in a person's life, you know, they, it, it, it can you can tell where they've been traumatized at because they literally at that age when it comes time to deal with an issue no i don't want to talk they go all crazy and you'd be like yo you acting like a whole kid like you adult why are you acting like that you're acting childish why because in that area of trauma and where they experience a similitude of trauma in that way they've never matured mentally past that stage they never, you haven't matured, you may have not matured mentally past that stage where the trauma happened to you. So what I'm telling you is, when we talk about this process, and the process is just, you know, it's a wilderness experience where God want to deliver you, okay? So when, so God want to open up these areas where you've been traumatized, where there's an unresolved conflict, and you're harboring demonic entities in there. And you wonder why you're so reactionary when things happen. You're not even responding to that person. You're not even responding to that situation. You're responding to layers of traumas that you never learned how to deal with. So now it's hindering, hindering your ability to have healthy relationships. It's hindering your ability to be successful on the job. It's hindering your ability to be fruitful and multiply. Why? Because your level of success in health 
is predicated upon your mentality changing. So when that word soul is the, it's the word suke, where we get the word psyche from, which means mind. So your soul is your mind, your will, and your emotions. It's also your personality and your identity, right? So it, uh, it's good for us to understand that, you know, God has showed you a vision. He showed you a dream. He showed you doing all these wonderful things. But for you to really walk in the fullness of that, the success of that, and the prosperity of that in a very healthy way, he has to mature your mindset. He has to, uh, you have to allow him, you should allow him to mature you emotionally. So then he has to go into the areas where you haven't matured emotionally, where you haven't matured mentally, okay? Now, I don't wanna get too deep into this part, but it's like, um, and during the pandemic, God has shown me about grieving. I thought grieving just mean you bit, you just sad when somebody died. And some of you, y'all saw the video I did. I did it uh, the beginning of 2021. And some of us was experiencing a lot of deaths back to back. And I was just like, wow, it's a lot of like, you know, and we was, some of us was experiencing people in the family dying, COVID, all this stuff. And we was like, oh, you know, God is good. No, stop. You know what I'm saying? You can't God is good this stuff away. Like you can't over spiritualize areas where you need to be healed. You got to give yourself a process of processing things in a healthy way. Now I say that because grieving is the healthy way to go through a trauma. Grieving does not mean be sorrowful and sad. Grieving is how you give yourself a chance to process your e emotions and allow yourself to process and have a healthy perspective of what happened to you. Now there's five stages of grieving. I'm not gonna go into that today. We'll talk about that at another time. But there's different stages of grieving that us Christians, we try to force people through. But oh, God is in control. Don't say that when people is grieving. Oh, everything happened for a reason. Don't say that when people are grieving. It's selfish. It's not healthy for you to do that. You want them to progress faster than their, than their healing process, right? So you got stages of grieving, right? So you go through an angry stage. So you lose somebody, you have to grieve that loss. You go through an angry stage and you're like, why did God let this happen? Wow, they just would have did this. You're mad because it happened to you. But you got to process that. You got to work through that in a healthy way. So you can have a healthy perspective about it. And then you go through, I'm about to share this. And then you go through another stage of grieving something that you blame yourself. You blame yourself, right? And I, I'll talk about the stages of grief at another time. But I'm just, I want to show you this principle. So you go through the stage where you blame yourself. Dang, if I just would have done better, you know, dang, if I would have just, if I would have been there, man, if I would have reached out to him one more time, maybe if I would have prayed, they wouldn't die. Like maybe if I could have did something, you see what I'm saying? You start blaming yourself, but that's healthy. You have to go through that. You have to allow yourself to process those, those emotions and come on the end of, up the other end of it with a healthy perspective about your responsibility and what happened. Why am, why am I saying this? Because if you don't grieve something properly, any area that you don't grieve properly, that's where the strongholds settle in. So if you don't go through the angry stage and process your, your emotions of angry anger because of what the trauma that happened to you, if you don't process that in a healthy way, then that's exactly where you get a stronghold at. That's exactly where the enemy come in, in that stage of your trauma and create a stronghold and a defense mechanism because you didn't learn how to process the anger the right way. Well, let's say you deal with the anger, but then you go through the stage of you blaming yourself. If you don't process, pros if you don't, if you don't, pro um, I'm kidding, I lost the words. If you don't go through it and have a healthy perspective and process it correctly, then guess what? That's exactly where the demons come in. And then you get a stronghold of what? Insecurity. So I'm telling you this is how the strongholds form. So why you got to talk about your childhood? Why you got to go into your past? Because these are unresolved conflicts. 
and you never grieve them properly and you never work through them properly to have a healthy perspective. A lot of us couldn't have a healthy perspective because we was five years old, seven years old. What type of healthy perspective are you supposed to have when you're seven? You shouldn't have never dealt with that stuff. So now that we're older and we have more seasoned people around us, maybe a therapist, maybe an angel, a spiritual leader or whoever, you have a healthier system that can, now you can deal with it, open it up and really um, process through it. Now, the reason I'm saying that because it says you can't be successful and be healthy in life. You're only, you're only successful and healthy in life to the capacity of your mind being healthy about the things that you're going through. So we have, you, you, you know, it, it behooves us to learn how to work through things in a healthy way. That's why when something happened, we say you should confess it. Well, I only want to confess it to God. Well, you've been doing that forever. Like you've been praying about it, but that doesn't mean you know how to pray, but you don't know how to process it correctly and come out with a healthy mentality. And you get stuck every time. So some of you confessing, you're chatting, but you still don't know how to work through things. You still don't know how to process the trauma. We just came out the pandemic. You got layers of trauma you don't even know because you don't even know how to identify. You Okay, I don't want to. We may not know how to identify even if we are traumatized because we over-spiritualize stuff. And we, oh, God is good. I'm, I'm okay. You're lying. No, you're not. Be honest. Be transparent. We having you confess. Oh, I don't want, I'm, you just confessing because somebody told you. No, you. this is a tool to help you learn how to process your, your emotions and what you're going through in a healthy way so you can have a healthy perspective because wherever you get stuck mentally, you're capping yourself from being successful in your journey. You're capping yourself from being healthy in what God called you to do. So we over-spiritualize it and say, God told me, and I'm only going to listen to God and I don't want nobody to tell me nothing. I'm just going to pray and you ain't healthy. You think that's healthy, but you're not healthy. That's not healthy for you. You see what I'm saying? That's why the Bible says confess your faults one to another. Because sometimes you want to confess to God and amen. You should confess everything to God. But the reason why I'm telling you confessing to God is not healthy because it's still a secret. You're not bringing it in the light. You're not bringing it in the open. You're still hiding it. That's why you want to confess only to God and not to man because you can keep it hidden. That's why the Bible tells you confess one to another. Because you can bring it into a light, the exact natures of your own. Well, it's under the blood. No, it's still a secret. And that's why you can't. Uh, Proverbs 28, verse 13 says, it says, he that conceals a thing will not prosper. That's what I'm saying. So you holding it all in. You don't want nobody to know. And it's hindering your ability to process things in a healthy way which means it's hindering your mind from being in a healthy place. And if your mind is not in a healthy place, it hinders your ability to be fruitful and healthy and prosperous on your journey. So I, I just thought that was worth sharing. And I thought it was very powerful as I've been meditating this on the last, on the last few weeks, last, like the last month or so. And wherever we're hindered in how we process things, Mentally, it hinders our interactions with people. Every time you talk to, oh, you, you're angry, you're full of anger, and it's, you're roused up. Why? Because something happened to you that made you angry, and you never learned how to process through it in a healthy way. Now, every time you interact with people, that anger come out. Every time somebody say something slick to you, your anger got to rise up. You want a job, and then the supervisor tell you to do something, then your anger flare up, and then you get fired. And then you act like it's somebody else's fault. No, it's your fault. You acting like, well, God, everything happened for a reason. Yeah, God don't got nothing to do with that. God don't got nothing to do with you. Well, God did it. He allowed. No, God didn't allow that. You allowed it. You allowed it because you're not healthy. Don't put God on that. God don't got nothing to do with that. You're irresponsible. You didn't. You didn't take responsibility for your own mind. Your mind is not God's responsibility. Your mind is not my responsibility. Your mind is not Jesus' responsibility. Your mind is not your pastor's responsibility. Your mind is your responsibility. The Bible says you be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's your responsibility. 
Your mind is your responsibility. Amen. So before I let Brittany go, do anybody have any comments or thoughts they wanted to share or anything I said? All right, all right, Brittany, go ahead, take it away. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, May is Mental Health Awareness Month. Um, so I think this also ties into Mental Health Awareness Month. Um, that was some pretty heavy information, so I have a little icebreaker. <laughs> I'm gonna share my screen. Um, I have a little icebreaker. Um, uh, can somebody give me access to share my screen? Wow, I'm just waiting for access to share my screen. All right, so for all of those who have their camera on, I can't see you. Let me see, all right, here I go. All right, so all of those who have their camera on, we're gonna just do like a, a quick icebreaker, a little indoor scavenger hunt. Stop looking at my list, cause I see some of y'all cheating. I see somebody, I see some of y'all cheating up there. All right, so for everybody that wanna participate, just raise your hand if you wanna participate. All right, Moses, can you be a ref? All right, Regina, oh, dang, I want you to be a ref. All right, you can be in the game. No, you can be in the game. You can be in the game. All right, we got indoor the items. I, well, I can't tell you because then that that's not it's not fun if we do, if I tell you everything. I got you right here. You gotta get it one at a time. It's gonna take about three minutes. All right, so I got all the contestants ready with your camera on. Dang, y'all see two of them. Y'all cheating. All right, all right, you got 10 seconds to find toilet paper, go. Look at that. <laughs> got it. Uh, Evie, what you got, toilet paper in the kitchen? <laughs> all right, all right, all right. Can you see me? me? Yo, I can't Evie, see you. Gotta help. Evie, you, you cheating, she cheating. No, I'm not, I did not cheat. Evie, where you get that toilet paper from that fast? She got a healthcare basket in her uh, kitchen, I think. I she got something downstairs. She got it in a box. Uh, she is. She is. She give. Ain't you giving us a certain amount of time to get each each thing? Yeah, but we moving. Kalia, you got to get it. All right, I'm you gonna ain't count say that. nothing about talk. You ain't say nothing about Next shampoo. One. She read that one in this. All right, right shampoo. Go. She she got it in her kitchen. Look at her. Got Ten, it. nine, eight. She Seven, got you. I'm done. Six, five, four, three, <laughs> two, one. Uh, oh, damn. <laughs> a mug or a cup? I'm done. Nope. What? Look at Evie. Evie got everything. The smaller, listen, the smaller you have. Look at, look at. All right. Okay. I like that cup, Felix. Let me just lower my hand and just look at y'all play. No, it's okay. You it's, you gotta get all the items. 
Something green, money green, money green. Ah, got it! <laughs> it's the cucumber and the lighter. For I'm okay. done, Evie. Evie, funny. <laughs> she got a cucumber. All right, okay. A pen. Got it! Look at Regina. <laughs> All right, sunglasses. I, you I got, got these. That. Where are your sunglasses at? Look at Kalia. Mom, Where are your glasses? Where are your glasses, Evie? Mom, hold up, Brittany. Hold on, Brittany. Look in the cereal box, Evie. She got something like the cereal box. I was he got got stuff, but he in the car. <laughs> All right, a red. Wait, I can't see the thing. The chat thing is over. Get down. Nah, I can't. I can't make it too big. Mom, oh no, y'all seen that? Y'all is y'all looking at stuff. A random sock, a random. Got it. Those are my socks. What are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> I'm done. You, Nick, you got a random sock. Took they took it off their feet. feet. Yeah, he she took Aiden's sock off his feet. Yeah. All right, I think that's all right. Who won? I think about everything Please. in the kitchen. Please. No, I'm a little, I'm worried now. You got socks in the kitchen, shampoo. He took Aiden's sock. All right, I see Regina oh. and Nelsa. All right. All right, Felix, I think you're going to win this one. Mm -hmm. All right, paper airplane, paper airplane. Oh. Yeah, but to make one, you probably don't even know how to make one, to be honest Ooh. with you. I got it. Wait, what the? <laughs> I, I told you guys she doesn't know how to make one. Hey, it's paper airplane. A bootleg paper airplane, that is. Go ahead. Go with your room. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. Well, <laughs> I mean, by show of hands, I'm going to say I'll between Evie and Regina, I don't know how Evie, I didn't talk to Evie before this, so I don't know how she had every item at her kitchen. Maybe I got was, everything too. Says you went, you're a winner. We're all a winner here. No, that's what you tell the losers. That's what you tell the losers. Everybody's a winner. winner here, guys. I just wanted to transition you and have a little ice break. You're all winners. You get recognition trophy. Listen, you sing your song, Kalia. I win. <laughs> <laughs> we win. We win. We win. We win. Come on, you see these shades? This is a winner right here. Hello. Y'all, I just want y'all all to won. Win. This is my winning season, okay? <laughs> it's my winning season. <laughs> Clearly, Nilsa, how you have everything right yeah. there. <laughs> this is my one. Yeah, Nilsa. <laughs> Baby, she has shampoo, socks, towels, groceries, linen, perfume, all in one room. My God. All right. So, all right. Now to something a little more, not serious, but in the line with Moses was talking about. So I'm going to just spend probably like 15 to 20 minutes talking about mental oh, health, no, focus. Focus. mental health awareness, um, and, you know, just a little bit about the effects of COVID and kind of how the process, how God is so amazing that we have leaders and how all of this process is like therapy on steroids. We have access to so much information and so much wisdom that just a practical way to understand the process. I know for me, sometimes during the process, um, I don't know if I'm coming or I'm going, if I'm passing or I'm failing. So to try to be practical, practical about how the process ties into mental health and how deliverance is connected to getting a victory over belief systems that uh, defense mechanisms that come as a result of what we've been through or patterns that we've seen in our household growing up. So mental health awareness month, the, the theme of this year is actually uh, back to the basics. So as a result of the pandemic, we know stress, isolation, and uncertainty. By just a show of hands, how many people really had an increased sense of fear, loneliness, or like, you know, worry during COVID? Just raise your hand if, if that's you. 
I meant the, the hand, the hand button, the hand. <laughs> I raised it. Your physical hand or your the hand? Okay. Looks like it's everybody. Okay, I'm mad. So what I'm going to do is kind of talk a little bit about how that affects your mind, will, and emotion. So um, School of Light to me does a lot of therapy, like a lot of different types of therapy. Um, but the one therapy I want to focus on is something that I, I, I hope we can all kind of agree. I don't know if they know that they're doing it, but I feel like they're doing it. So one thing I feel like they're doing is cognitive behavioral therapy. So what is that? So cognitive behavioral therapy is, uh, let me move this over. So it helps people learn how to identify and change destru destructive or disturbing thought patterns that have a negative influence on behavior or emotions. So what, what is that saying? Okay. So maybe so if i have an issue with um anger you know somebody may say journal and in my journaling maybe that is going to help me identify why am i angry right so and then maybe I, I i i meet with my leader and they may help me identify okay when you're angry you respond this way and what is your behavior response so it kind of helps you like really break down uh your behavior in more practical ways. So whether it's somebody telling you a story, um, you know, somebody may share something with you or somebody's preaching is really just teaching you different ways that people deal and respond to their situation. So I'm gonna be reviewing, um, let me one second, your core emotional needs, because this is really about emotional wellness, right? So. Emo what is what is uh, emotional need? So a lot of times I feel like our strongholds and defense mechanisms, at least mine, come from these places. Um, so the six core emotion need emotional needs are our ego's needs. The ego's way of feeling okay and that all is good in transformation is when the ego perceives that these core needs will be met, then it judges the change is good. When the ego perceives they are at risk, then we believe we have a problem. So what does that mean? If I'm not used to like talking to people and opening up, when somebody asks me a question, I may, you know, as a result of not feeling secure or safe, I may shut down or choose not to share or communicate. So how, so if you have issues with insecurity, security might be a emotional, a core emotional need that you struggle with. So this is what security is. So needing to feel secure and physically and emotionally safe and cared about. So what does the chats and the confession gives us? It gives us a safe person to kind of identify and talk to somebody in which we can feel emotionally and physically safe. So you're like, why do I have to confess? Why do I have to go through the process? A lot of times I, I know that, you know, for me, it was very hard for me to confess or even be consistent in my confession because I was used to being independent and doing things on my own. So the idea that I had to tell somebody how I feel, well, the truth of the matter is sometimes it takes me longer to even know how I feel. So I'm like, well, what do I say? Well, what I learned to do is just say that whatever I feel. So then that person that is assigned to me could teach me what it is that I'm feeling because they may be able to see from a different place and be like, okay, that's what, how anger shows up for you or different things like that. Um, so how many people think that uh, security is something? This And this is also a person who like, they gotta make sure all their bills paid. They like, you, everything gotta be a certain way. You know I mean, you gotta save a lot of money. You hate when you only got this amount of money in your bank account. So by a show of hands, how many people feel like they struggle with security? Like security is really important to you. And it's okay because it's an emotional, a core emotional need. I see a couple hands raised. Kind of can't see both. And I'll send this out to people if you're interested. Okay. All right. So the next one is this is for people who may have 
like people who I feel like one thing I really like about School of Light is soon as I came, it was like everybody was hugging me. I was like, yo, leave me alone. I ain't never had this much love. Right. But it was so much inclusion and connection. It was like everywhere you look, you're going to come. Somebody going to hug you and make sure you feel like you belong. So this is pe for people who um, need to be invited to join a group or be a part of what's happening in a relationship with others. The funny thing I think about this core emotional need, a lot of people who love language is time, they sometimes don't give themselves connection. Like they don't interact with people, because they might be busy, but a lot of times people, you know, want to be involved and want to be included in connection. So this is like, I think School of Light really does a really good job of this is like we get to join different groups they create different avenues for us to speak, learn. We got prosthetic class. We have so many different things that like, if you don't feel like you belong, I, I, I mean, I don't know how, but I'm sure your feelings are valid. You may have felt that way at some time, but I think I really, that's one thing I really like about the ministry is that from the moment I got here, I felt really included and connected. Uh, do, how, do, do pe how do people feel about that? Would you guys say the same thing? Thumbs up for yes, thumbs down if you want to express. <laughs> okay, amen. And if not, reach out to y'all leaders. They're going to take care of that immediately. <laughs> uh, all right, so this is a big one for people with trauma uh, power. This is a big one. If you got trauma, you know, don't tell me what to do, how to do it. I manifest it. If you got oppositional defiant disorder, like your sis right here, this is a this is a big one for people that struggle with authority. So this is needing to have direct influence over the outcome and process of change, needing things to go as I want, needing to maintain power or influence as a result of change. So some of your defense mechanisms could be. Well, what would they think of me? Like, how did, you know, how would this go if I don't do this right? So these are, so how trauma works is a lot of intrusive thoughts. So what I like about the process is it helps us break down our thoughts into bite-sized pieces. And one thing some of my leaders always say is like, God ain't going to have you work with everything at once. He only going to have you work with one thing at a time. Because we know people who need to have direct influence or power they might want to control every situation, but really it's only, you know, what part of process are, are you on currently and how is God using that to help influence the next behavior? Because we know it's all connected. So I think for me, I see the change in like my integrity, wanting to be on time, making a schedule. And I, I'm still shocked that I be doing these things. But I think, you know, learning how the process is working for my good is interesting because I would say a couple months ago, I wouldn't do none of these things. I mean, probably before I came here, I wouldn't do none of these things. So it's like really learning that I really don't have to understand it. And I don't need as much power as my defense mechanisms tell me that I need. Um, order and control. So um, needing to know what's going on at all times and to have things be predictable, structured, and planned. Needing logic and order and change with minimal surprises. How many people is that? <laughs> that is your uh, control freaks, your OCD people. This is your area. You better own it. It's okay because it's a core emotional need. There's nothing wrong with it. It's nothing wrong with needing to know how uh, things go, right? And to, it's a, a need, but when it becomes a problem, especially in the process, God is gonna do more like the stuff that I'll be doing I'd be, I don't even feel crazy. I'd just be like, amen, this is what I'm going through today. This is my test. So God is full of surprises. And one thing I got taught through this ministry is like, God isn't convenient. I think we want God to do things the way we want him to do it versus kind of what he has planned for our life. So as much as, as hard as the process is for me, I'm thankful because he knows what he, the plans he has for me. And I don't know who he calls me to be or who I'm going to be, but I know I'm a better person as a result of following instructions or like doing the things that they asked me to do. 
um, you know, it, it, it's kind of like from wearing glasses to changing the way I dress, um, different, you know, slowing down when I walk, uh, I, supposedly all those things matter, right? But growing up, I never learned these things. So as a result, I may have mannerisms and things that now I'm under different counsel and wisdom, I may want to work on them and change it. So if I struggle with order and control and somebody just give me a simple instruction to slow down, I'm going to be like, well, you, why are you telling me that right now? But it's like, it's a surprise to me and it's shocking my brain because I'm not used to someone holding me accountable in that way. But I think the beauty of the core emotional needs is when you start to get these needs met is that somebody sees that area for you, right? Somebody hears that cry or that prayer of something that you've been longing for. So competence, needing to feel capable, effective, skilled, and right. So this is again for people who like, you don't know, like in the process, like yesterday, I, I guess I try to trick Asia and say like, well, did I do, did I do this? And she was like, no. I'm like, <laughs> like, I, that, I was like, so is that answering a question? And she said, like, no, like, I'm not, that's not, I'm not going to feed that. Like, you're not going to, know. your job is to learn, right? So in the process, if we struggle with competence, the process is going to be really hard for us to commit to because we may want to be perfect at something that we don't even have an understanding of, or we might, we may want to feel capable. So kind of really prepare that this competence thing is going to be the one thing that's going to get targeted through the process. You're not going to get it right. You're going to, you're going to fail daring greatly, right? The courage is to try and to be like, and you know, I feel like every time I get in trouble, because I be getting in trouble, y'all, um, I get in trouble in the most grace and compassion way. And sometimes it leads me to change. Like I don't even res resist it. I'm like, you know what? Thank you. Because I didn't know, right? So I'm a person that people have like never really held accountable or I got away with murder. So it's like to be in a place where I don't get away with it. I like it. I really, I really like it. But my defense mechanisms don't you know, but I think the part of me that wants to grow and be cured and tried and like burn for God, I'm like, okay, you know what? I don't want to be, I don't want to sow that. I want to be, I want to be a better person, right? So I just want to encourage you guys like confidence, although it's a core emotional need here at this church, <laughs> you may not always feel confident, but because it's a school, you could get an A, B, C, or D. That's what I like. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's okay to get a bad grade here and they'll still work with you. So that's my favorite part. I love the school. Um, and then justice and fairness. So this is for somebody that kind of got treated unfair. These are like my lawyers, my sisters that's really like, but why did she, why is that, right? So this is your chronic complainer, right? Because it's really not a bad thing. But is that you really see things not going well. So you want to speak and you want to advocate. I'm, the, I'm her, right? I'm like really big on justice and fairness. But if God has me in a season where I'm getting the victory over pride, then maybe I have to suffer things. So kind of what I'm learning is like everybody is in a different season. And like God is working with us all differently. But in therapy, we're taught to do no harm, right? So how do we do no harm to each other? And if someone is struggling, how do we pick each other up instead of like knocking each other down, right? Because we're all like kindness is contagious, right? Like if everybody's like, yo, you, so I, for, for me, I, I see a lot of kindness in the ministry. Uh, I feel like people very crying, even when somebody tell me something, clean your glasses, something simple, you know what I'm saying? I feel like they do it or fix your shirt. They come over, they help me. So I may understand nature versus nurture and may be in a season where I would rather be nurture and then be defensive of like, my mom didn't teach me this. My dad didn't teach me this. So why don't I let these people teach me? Where I feel like what I'm learning is the grace is sufficient. So what my mother and father couldn't teach me, there's a body here that I can learn from. So although I have defense mechanisms, although I have strongholds, and although sometimes my ego pers have these thoughts that this is a risky situation I kind of choose to like tear down the vain imaginations because we know as a result of trauma we got a, a lot of defense mechanisms in a vain imaginations so 
that's the ego so hold on for one second um all right so let me help you guys understand the brain on trauma so i'm not going to review this but i just want you guys to look at it Well, I'll send any of these resources out if you want to review them, but just really wanting to shed light on COVID. They are identifying COVID-19 um, in connection to World War II. So it's like a season for us to give ourselves grace and compassion because we're, we're coming out of a global pandemic. We're coming out of time where parents had to be home with their kids and be teachers. And I don't think any of us was prepared and sort of like what Moses is saying, like we can't act like things don't happen to us. And I think for me, I was very strong and it was like, who helps the helper? So I'm, I'm grateful for the ministry because I had I took an FMLA, I took some time off. I'm just returning back to work and I'm like, my God, I like my break. <laughs> um, I, I like kind of that, you know, while I wanted to rescue others, I wanted to rescue me, you know, so. Um, so kind of what I, what I want to do now is I want to share, uh, I watch a lot of thought leader videos. So Brene Brown is a thought leader and she speaks about like, um, shame and vulnerability and the call, like courage is contagious. So I just kind of want to share with you guys, like, you know, I really enjoy for me because I really struggle with vulnerability that when you guys are open, it gives me freedom to share, right? So when I was uh, watching the uh, dance ministry and I was seeing Dr Gracie dance the gyra, that kind of really broke me. I I'm never going to forget that. And then Regina danced the built for this. Then I was like, okay, I could do it, right? So it's like, everybody has a different ministry. Everybody brings something different to the table, but all our gifts are working together for your good. So Z may have gave me a journal. The hospitality team may have given me something different. Somebody else may have played a favorite song. Janice got up there and shared, you know, and then we did different exercise. So I feel like every time somebody shares, like, don't think that it's not setting somebody else free. Like we all have different gifts. I may be good at communication, but may struggle in other areas, right? So it's like, all right, then you can help me here and I can help you there. But for me, I want to be in a culture that is not divided, but like standing together to help people like win the war in the mind, right? So that's my, that's what I'm bringing to the ministry is counseling. I want to help you win the war in your mind. Why? Because I was at war, right? So I'm, I'm able to really like, you're not talking to somebody that not just, I'm saying this as a testimony that I'm learning how to self-regulate, that I am really emotional. I got complex trauma. I've been through a lot of things. So as a result of these things, they, the Bible says those are those we are rescued to rescue others, right? So I'm just kind of like, all right, okay, mental health. Thank you. I, this is my lane, right? And then trying to just stay in that lane of like teaching people about the mind and emotions and different things we can do to help each other, whether it's positive affirmation statements or different things, but I'm going to let the video speak, um, and then I'm going to turn it back over to Moses. Uh, no, that ain't it. All right, let me stop right here. Thanks. Give me one share. So this is Brene Brown. She is a thought leader. Uh, let me know if you guys can hear this. It's simply what's okay. Can you guys hear? I can't see you. Can you guys hear? Yes. Here. 
Okay. All right. First time in history. You wanted more from her. You wanted more tips from her. So we have Renee Brown with seven additional super tips. The, the definition of boundary that I use in the book. Boundary is simply what's okay and what's not okay. What I think we do is we don't set boundaries. We let people do things that are not okay or get away with behaviors that are not okay. Then we're just resentful and hateful. Me, I'd rather be loving and generous and very straightforward with what's okay and what's not okay. To assume the best about people is almost an inherently selfish act because the life you change first is your own. Then one day I found myself on a military base talking to special forces and I just asked a simple question. Give me an example of courage that you've seen or witnessed in your life or that you know, you've done yourself that didn't require uncertainty, risk, and emotional exposure, which is mm. the definition of vulnerability. Give me mm. a single example of courage that did not require that. And there was just silence until one guy just raised his hand and said, three tours, ma'am, there is no courage without vulnerability. Four skill sets. Can you rumble with vulnerability? Can you stay in tough things when they get uncomfortable and awkward, or do you tap out? Mm. Two, Mm -hmm. and, and this is a hard one, living into your values. Are you clear about what your values are and have you operationalized those into behaviors? Do you know what behaviors support your values, what don't? Three, braving trust. Can you build trust and be trustworthy? Mm -hmm. And the last one, which I think was really interesting, was learning how to get back up, learning how to rise. Because we found that people are more willing to be courageous up front if they know how to rise. And so courage is contagious and we can teach it, we can learn it, we can measure it. And we have to create cultures where being armored all the time is not rewarded behavior. The greatest casualty of trauma is vulnerability. The, the worst thing we lose in trauma is vulnerability. And let's be very clear about what constitutes trauma. Racism is trauma. Poverty is trauma. Classism, trauma. Homophobia, heterosexism, trauma. And so the, the, the biggest casualty of that is I can't be vulnerable. Well, when vulnerability, the, the ability to really be who we are, becomes a realm of only the privileged. We have lost our capacity to create a school, a home, and a country that we love. I don't think you can get to courage without the capacity to deal with uncertainty, risk, and emotional exposure. And we've mythologized vulnerability. I'm not saying be vulnerable for vulnerability's sake. I'm saying when things get hard and uncomfortable, don't tap out of difficult conversations. Stay in them, lean into them, even when they're uncomfortable, awkward, hard. Find moments of collective joy and pain and be a part of them. Pass the peace with people you want a frog in the arm. Come to the rail, sing, grieve together in community. And we don't do enough of that. And it's not just around church, it's about music, sometimes sport. Find ways to be with people in communion that you don't know as a reminder that that connection between all of us can, is, is real and alive, whether we forget it or not. And so to me, vulnerability is our most accurate measure of courage. I mean, it's pretty powerful when I have 13,000 pieces of data collected over 12 years that I cannot find a single incident or story of courage that was not completely underpinned by vulnerability. I think the problem arises that it's, there are so many little paradoxes with vulnerability. And one of them is that vulnerability is courage in you, but weakness in me. When I meet you, it's the first thing I look for in you, but it's the last thing I want to show you in me. And so I think to really put ourselves out there, knowing that if we do that enough, we're going to fail. I just don't think it gets more courageous than that.
when, when perfectionism is driving, shame is always riding shotgun. We struggle with perfectionism in areas where we feel most vulnerable to shame. Does that make sense? So we're all comfortable saying, yeah, I'm a little perfectionistic, which is code for like, I do things really well. Um, but I don't really, I'm not comfortable saying I have shame. But perfectionism, what is that? I call it the 20 ton shield. Here's what perfectionism really is. It's a way of thinking that says this, if I look perfect, live perfect, work perfect, I can avoid or minimize criticism, blame, and ridicule. All perfectionism is, is the 20 ton shield that we carry around hoping that it'll keep us from being hurt. When in truth, what it does is it keeps us from being seen. Those are seven super tips from Brene Brown. If you didn't listen to the original version with Brene Brown, go ahead and download that today. But remember, this show is designed to unlock and unlock. So thank you guys for listening. Um, that was a video that really helped me start to, she has like all these different, all this different research, but you know, it's like shame versus guilt. Um, and, you know, when you start to understand that the things that happened to you growing up, like the hardest revelation I think I had was like, so you telling me that I'm still dealing with that? Like that still, yeah. is, that's still showing up. How is it? So then it was just like the acceptance of, all right, well, I guess it's time to face it, right? So it's just like the bravery and the courage to be able to look at yourself and go back and be kind to the little girl or whatever age you got stuck at or the young man, whatever age you got stuck at is to almost go back and pick that person up so you realize that. Um, so I just want to say to you guys that we're not powerless over our pain. Like Moses said that God's not, you know, although he didn't allow because these things happen, it doesn't matter. It's going to work together for our good. So although the process, it feels like you don't understand it, I'm telling you, um, I got more integrity than I ever had, more faith than I ever had. I'm excited to be back at work. I want to be on time to sessions um, and different things that, you know, I wouldn't say, like I told you guys, I wasn't all bad, but I wasn't all good. And I, I was smart, you know, I'm smart. So I was able to manipulate a lot of situations, but today I don't want to do that. I kind of want to be honest. I just want to really represent, you know, the love of the father, you know, and so good seed. So thanks for letting me share. Amen. Amen. It's good information. Would anybody like to share with they? I don't know, Kalia, you have your hand raised. I don't know what you mean. All right, come on, Kenny. Awesome job, Sister Britt. Um, you know, I really like that video. And one thing you said at the end is like, you want to go back to where you were stuck at. And I just hit me like, boom. Because when I was talking to somebody yesterday about Proverbs chapter 19, verse 11. And this is have good sense, right? Have good sense, not bad sense, but a good sense. You know, because the honor and the glory is when you can overlook an offense, you know, or trauma or transgression, right? So the, the, the glory of God is when you can overlook an offense or transgression. So it's not good to be stuck there because you can get stuck there. You can be bitter for 20 years. You can be angry for five years and you could be stuck there. And it's dangerous, like you said, you know, to be stuck there because when people press that button, wherever you stuck at, that's what they're going to get. So it's, it's, it's I, it just, I just love what you said because the glory of God is to overlook and some, and some, uh, uh, and some uh, other verses, it say, not overlook, but when you pass over. And I was like, wow, not to be stuck somewhere, but to pass over. Not to be offended, not to stay in that offense, but to overlook it, because that's where the glory of God. The glory of God is a movement. 
You know what I mean? The glory of God is a moving, a spiritual growth. And, you know, that's that's what happened with the Pharisees when they came at Jesus. They were stuck. Jesus tried to bring them up to speed, but they were stuck. And God was like, no, you got it wrong. Nicodemus, you must be born again, bro. You stuck. But when you unstick yourself, when you be able to pass over or overlook an offense, overlook a trauma, learn from it, be, be able to pass over, that's where the glory of God at. That's where the honor is at. It's, it's, it's to continue in a movement and not to be stuck. Amen. Amen. It's good revelation. Come on, Nilsa. Guys, it's Nilsa, and and I'm coming to you live from my kitchen, and I won our game. I just want everybody to know that I'm the winner of the game, okay? So I won't be introducing myself as the addict. I'm the winner tonight, okay? Winner, winner, chicken dinner. Come on, and champion. I have chicken for dinner. <laughs> Anyway, I I love Brielle Brown, uh, Brittany, just so you know. She is someone, she's like my go-to when I need like a topic for my AA meetings, you know. Um, and we just love her on there because a lot of us in, you know, in recovery, we're very vulnerable, depending on the different phases of our recovery, right? So, um, <laughs> it's funny because... I don't know why, but I always think about Jacob when I think about vulnerability. I think about Jacob. Yo, Jacob was a certified mama's boy. I don't care what nobody tell me. He was a mama's boy. His mama was the one who taught him, you know, really how to manipulate, right? And, you know, she was trying to, she felt like it would it the the inheritance belonged to Jacob. So she felt that she was, you know, justified in what she was doing. But it still was a form of manipulation, you know, because they had to mani manipulate the father so that he can pass on the blessing to Jacob, right? So he went his entire ministry to me. This is how I see it in my mind, right? Being a certified mama's boy and a manipulator. Now, his mom was fearful for him that his brother was going to kill him, so she sent him off, right? And he went on, and he did great things for God. You know, he even wrestled with the angels for his blessing. How, who are you to be wrestling with the angels? But sometimes you just need your blessing, you're going to wrestle with them, right? But to me, when I, I think of that as, you know, you fight for your blessing, yes, I believe you should fight for your blessing. But for some reason, there was a cockiness to this Jacob. And God blessed him. God did a lot of, you know, God gave him huge, man, all these people, big family, all that, right? Y'all know the story. If you don't, you should read it. But he had to go back and face his brother, which was his biggest fear. And he had to go and wrestle with that thing. Now he's not wrestling with the with the angels that's going to give him the blessing. He's wrestling with the one thing that he feared the most. So when we go to this, I call it step five because I do work a program. I call it step five. And it's to confess to God, to myself, and then to another human being, the exact nature of my wrong, right? Because I would go to God and I would keep my secret. God's not going to expose me. God is not going to expose nothing that I have done. And I've done some really crazy things. But my anger, my emotions, every, everything, that every decision I made exposed, you know, the exact nature of my wrongs. My anger, my bitterness, my hate towards people, my pride was already being exposed. I just needed to be the one to confess it out of my own mouth. And I wrestled in this area of my process because I didn't want to tell nobody, you know, the darkness that was in me. But once I, I just did it, once I just said, okay, 
and I could, I'll share with with people here because I've never shared this with anybody, but I have with my sponsor. You know, when I was out there in my addiction, I really, I, I was, I was selling drugs before I was doing it just to make extra income. And I sold some Coke to someone and the next day he died from the product that I handed him. That was the one thing I'm going to tell everybody on this platform that I was going to go to the grave with. I was going to go to the grave with that secret. Only me and God needed to know that secret. Now, I'm being vulnerable. I'm being vulnerable, and I'm telling y'all some truth now, right? Because I done did some stuff. All y'all know is that I, my name is Nilsen. I'm an addict. Oh, I done did some stuff in my addiction. And I wrestled with that thing. I wrestled with being directly responsible and I carried this guilt and there was this weight that was on me like if I was responsible for that you know in my mind my mind kept telling me I was it was my fault it was my fault it was my fault I, I was suffering it wasn't, I wasn't released from that suffering until I actually spoke to somebody about it. You know, I was like, yo, I can't believe I, I had something to do with that, you know. The truth is, is that, you know, Pastor Moses said we are directly responsible for the things that, the choices that we make, right? Like, God doesn't cause these things to happen to us, you know. He had a heart condition. I didn't know he knew, right? You know, I had to go and seek forgiveness, you know, from God and, and, and talk to somebody because I was, this is a real thing. And it was causing me to like hindrance in my life. I kept feeling like it was me and that God was going to kill me and take my life because, you know, I had did this thing. It was all my fault, you know? I needed to be counseled. I needed help in that area. Can you imagine waking up every day thinking about that? You know? I had to face the greatest fear of my life. And I could not do that just talking to God, just saying, oh, I'm going to keep this secret. Because I was talking to God and still saying, God is my secret. It's just me and you, you know? That's real life issues that we deal with real life issues that keep us in bondage and we pretend like everything is okay well if everything is not okay be vulnerable talk to someone and you know regina said it so, i'm telling you something when she said these words it blew my mind well, you could tell my secret because i'm gonna tell it right along with you who remember when she said that? Can I get a show of hands, please? I know I wasn't alone when she said those words. She freed me. She freed me from saying those words that got put in her mouth. This woman brings forth healing. She probably don't even know what she, she needs to know. Because at that moment, I was freed from, from like, oh my God, I got to keep these secrets. I got to die with these secrets. No, I could tell God, I could tell myself, I could go to someone else and not worry about nobody judging me. You know how much healing that brought the, the vulnerability, the courage Thank you for letting me share. Thank you for helping me stay sober one more day. Real good. That's real good. Mama Marie, you still want to share? That's super powerful. Nah, nice I was raising my hand from when she was talking. I'm oh. sorry. I, am I didn't good. hear that. I just came back. Hey, if you done, can y'all, if y'all, sorry, if you, if y'all done sharing, can you put your hand down? Sorry. Nilsa. Kenny, <clears throat> just help me know who need to share, but God bless you. That was super powerful. Um, amen. I hope you guys was encouraged by that.
I hope you guys was blessed by um, Brene Brown. I also love her very much. Um, I hope I hope the breakdown that Brittany shared, and you may have to go back to the video and we'll, we'll even unravel more of that information in the future. All right. And this will be posted on the YouTube so you can go back to it. But it's a start. You know, being exposed to the right information is where change starts. And I hope that, you know, you will make a choice today that to, to allow God to prosper you mentally and emotionally in your soul so that you can walk in the greatness that he has for you. I really do. Um, you know, in Genesis, God said that it's not good for man to be alone. You know, Adam was the only God man, the only son of God in earth. He was surrounded by a bunch of animals. He was surrounded by, you know, trees and fruit and vegetation. Probably so much beauty, we've never even seen it before on earth. <clears throat> I can't imagine what a garden that God himself planted would look like. You know, I, I can't imagine what the animals looked like before they were infected with sin. I can't imagine what the ground looked like before it was infected with sin. I can't imagine what the sky and the atmosphere, the, the brightness of everything, the trees. In all of that beauty, in all of that richness, in all that splendor and glory, God would come down and manifest in a physical form, talk with Adam face to face as a man, share with him revelations, impart ingenious into him. Adam was such a genius, you know, it's no one like the like of Adam before Jesus. And even in all of that, God said, God would talk to him face to face daily. And God said, it's not good for him to be alone. God said, it wasn't healthy for Adam to only have a relationship with him in the midst of a garden full of blessing and prosperity. God said it wasn't healthy for him. God said that. I really been, I've been taking notes. I've been praying. You know what I'm saying? I've been really praying on this and I even asked people some questions about myself and my leadership, you know, people that may have left the ministry, people that I no longer have a relationship with that, you know, sat at my feet and received the word of God out of my mouth. And literally we have no relationship today. I've been asking a lot of questions about certain things, you know, because God showed me. And I just wanna to suggest to you that if you live life and you feel like the only person that you can trust is God and the only person that you can talk to and the only safe place you have is God or yourself. You know, the Bible says that, the scripture said today that God desires for you to prosper and be in good health, even as your soul prosper. And um, I just wanted to let you know and inform you that if that is where you are in your life, it's not healthy. And not only that, it's a curse. If the only person that you feel like you can trust is God, you know, your life is barricaded in. And um, my prayer is somehow we can find a balance and um, I, I apologize if I created this imbalance in any way. But I'm praying and I'm, my prayer for us is that we will be healthy in our lives and balanced. And every part of our life is functioning with the blessing of God. You can hear from God, but you can't get a business off the ground. You know what I'm saying? You can prophesy, 
but you don't know how to talk to people without anger. Like you so close to God, but you don't have no friends. We can speak in tongues, but we curse out our spouse, spouses. We can speak life to one another at church when the spirit is high, but in anger, we, we declare curses over our children. I just desire like, we try to prove we don't need anybody but God. And we look sorrowful and depressed. My desire is like, I'm, I'm saying this because God showed me what have to be broken over this region for us to have a real move of God. It's not gonna be because we chant Jesus name over and over. It's not because we try to go pray in the streets. It's not because we speak in tongues for hours. All of that stuff is a part of it. It's not because we confess every day. It's not the process. But all of these things are a piece of it. But I'm just saying this because, and I'm gonna end this with this, that just like John, I wish above everything else that we would prosper and be in good health, even as our soul prosper, because that's what's really gonna open this region up. Us loving God and loving one another. Us having a healthy relationship with God and having a healthy relationship with one another. Not division, judgment, and um, people esteeming themselves greater than other people, people dishonoring people, thinking that their wisdom or words is more valuable than someone else's, thinking that we're doing God a favor by cutting people out of our life in self-righteousness. Like when our hearts is turned back to one another, that's when we see this region open up. Not trying to prove it's just you and God and you don't need a leader and you don't need nobody. It's not going to do it. It's not. But I'm just praying that by the supernatural power of God, that, um, you know, our hearts would be knit together in love and that the hearts of the children would be turned back to the fathers. The hearts of the fathers would be turned back to the children because that's the curse over this region. That's why we're not really seeing a real move of God because everybody divided in their self-righteousness of what they think God want to do. And I, my revelation is better than you. And God spoke to me and now you got to bow down hearts. And now if you don't receive it, I can't be a part of your life. That's why. Somehow we got to have a balance like where we just have healthy relationships in our lives where I have a healthy relationship with God and I have a healthy relationship with leaders and I have a healthy relationship with my brothers and sisters and I have a healthy relationship with people that I work with and I have healthy relationships with people in programs and I have healthy friendships and I have healthy relationship with my children, you know? So I just wanted to share that piece of my heart and uh, thanks for letting me share. And I just hope that, you know, out of these lessons, we'll find a reason to um, have courage to face the challenges. Nobody want to open up this stuff. Nobody want to deal with this old stuff. You'd rather keep it covered in the blood. You know, nobody want to 
you know, share the deep, intimate secrets of their heart like Nilsa just shared. Nobody who wants to do that. It's, it's painful. It hurts. You know, you, you rather just not face it. But what I determined in myself is, is it worth it? Is what I'm believing God for on the other side. Me having healthy relationships with my brothers and sisters and me having healthy ministry partners and me having a healthy relationship with God. A healthy relationship with God is not, you know, you just suffering and this everything God want to do. A healthy relationship is mutual. That's not healthy. A healthy relationship is not you trying to control God and you making him do whatever you want him to do with the scripture. That's not healthy either. A healthy relationship is not everything God wants. It's a relationship. It's a partnership. And, you know, wherever you may be in your walk with God, that's fine. But I'm just saying, like, I just hope that in me sharing my heart and anything that's shared tonight will give you the courage to say, you know what? I'm willing to face whatever I have to face, even the ugly parts of my life, even the ugly parts of my past, even the ugly parts of my heart. And be honest and vulnerable and stop trying to Jesus paid it all in the way he did pay it all. And stop, and stop trying to, oh, it's in the blood of Jesus in a way. Amen. Because your heart is an everlasting habitation and everything that you ever experience it still lives in your heart right now. And um, I just hope that we will find the courage, like Brene Brown said, to be vulnerable and say, you know what, I'm going to face this ugly stuff. Because the glory to be revealed on the other side is worth it. I don't want to be the greatest apostle. I don't care about that. I don't want to have the greatest anointing. I don't want people to see me. I want something to hit this area in the likes that they have never seen God show up before. And if I have to be scrutinized and ugly parts of my life, I got it got to be prodded and picked and opened up then to me, that great, that glory is worth it. The Bible says this light affliction is but for a moment, but it brings forth a greater glory on the other side. So I hope you was blessed by this Bible study. Um, I love each and every one of you. I'm praying for you. Please pray for me and my journey. Um, I have good days. I have bad days, but I'm in the hand of God. I have faith in him. I'm, pull, I'm fully persuaded that those that diligently seek him, he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. I'm diligently seeking him and I encourage you to do the same. Would somebody like to close us out in prayer? Nilsa. Guys, my name is Nilsa, and I am the winner tonight. Um, and I just want to say before we go, um, before we end out in prayer, that Apostle Moses, I stand with you, Soul Church. I stand with you, and I stand with God and the vision and the mission of Soul Church. Father, we come before you in the name of your precious son, Jesus. We give you all the praise and all the honor for the price that was paid for us at the cross. We thank you that we could come as vulnerable as we are with our, our authentic selves, God, to bless you and thank you for the things that you have helped us to overcome. We thank you for the leaders that have paid the way, that have gone the way before us to be our teachers. For the influence of a great teacher can never be erased. So we thank you for the teachers that you have placed before us. God, the teachers that help us to stay on the narrow straight path, God. We give you all the honor, the glory. I pray for each and every person on these squares, God, that you will send your angels to guard and protect them as they lay their heads to sleep, God. Be with us on this journey and this process. We pray to you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.
Amen. Family, the blessings is on us. The blessings is on us. Amen. Shalom, everybody. Amen. Shalom, everybody. Amen. 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 Good night. Good night. Good night.